The U.S. Elite and the U.S. Masses, the Second Constitution. We had just finished creating a first constitution. Why did the elites want a second one? Well, we were missing a couple of things. First off, we had to resolve problems regarding trade and duty among the 13 states. We talked about the problem of there being different currencies and different weights and measures, and we had to figure out how trade and, and taxes were really going to work between the 13 states. Secondly, we had to protect our overseas interests, both commercial and diplomatic. There was a problem in that if a small state, or even a large state like Virginia, wanted to trade with a country like France, it was difficult for them to present themselves in a manner in which France would really take them seriously. And so we had to think of a way to band together so that when we were trading, we were engaging in diplomacy with larger nations, they took us more seriously as a bigger entity. Thirdly, the elites wanted to cement the financial, property, and commercial interests of the elite class. This included property and slaves. There was absolutely nothing in the Articles of Confederation which made sure that there wouldn't be an attack on their financial property and their commercial interests. And lastly, the elites wanted to defend from the tyranny of the masses and the leveling of society. We're going to talk about all of these in depth a little more. So what was the problem? The war had just ended, and we just created the Articles of Confederation. Why would we create a situation where we had to come back and pretty much do it all over again? Well, the elite class had a problem, and it was mass unrest. The masses were the ones who went to the, went to the battle lines in order to fight during the Revolutionary War, and they were still fired up. They still had a lot of energy. They were coming back to the home front, and what they came back to was poverty. Uh, they had a lot of problems during that time. There were very heavy rents, and the state taxes were incredibly high. There were very low incomes. There were a lot of economic prisoners at this time, and so if you didn't pay uh, your economic debts, then you could actually be thrown into a debtor's prison, and you would go to jail for not paying your debt on time. And so a lot of people were so uh, under the water that they ended up in jail for it. And there were a lot of young beggars, a lot of children roaming the streets who had no uh, homes or means of supporting themselves. And these people, the masses, came back to their homes and realizes that they may have traded the oppression of the British Empire for the oppression of this new government, which really wasn't doing a whole lot for them either. And as you remember from previous lectures, we have a situation where if you have a political system lending power to a government and that power is not seen as legitimate because that political system really isn't giving that power in the proper way or isn't giving power at all and the government is just acting on its own, then we have a failure of legitimacy, a failure of authority, which breaks down into violence. The tipping point of all of this really was an event called Shays Rebellion. Uh, this picture is of Jan Daniel Shays. He was a small farmer, uh, he was a freeholder, and he was a veteran of the war and one of those who came back to see uh, these problems which had surmounted while he was away. He had tried peaceful protest and petition for years but really hadn't gotten anywhere. And so in 1787, with many of his comrades from war, they captured the courthouses in western Massachusetts. He gathered up a whole bunch of people, and they, with their guns, by the way, they were armed from the, from the army, so they had their own personal weapons with them. They captured the courthouses. They pretty much went in and threw out the judges and all of the staff and occupied the courthouses uh, in all of western Massachusetts. This sparked revolts elsewhere throughout the states, and people went and freed debtors from debtors' prison by breaking open the jails. They would go and stand on farms that were going to be foreclosed and just pretty much dare those foreclosing, foreclosing parties to come in and try to take the land from them. Uh, when you had a party coming to try to foreclose the place, and you had a whole bunch of people standing out there so that, you know, with their own weapons, so that there is no way to really get through them, there was no way for these foreclosures to take place. Remember, there was no national militia at this time. There was no way to call out the National Guard, per se, in order to put down insurrections. And so these types of revolts were breaking out everywhere as people realized that they were very unhappy with what the new government had created. 
And this really stirred a fear of something called leveling in the elite class. The fear of leveling was the leveling of the playing field, a redistribution of the land. At this point, remember, we're looking at a very, very tiny sliver of an elite class owning 99.9%, 99.99% of all of the land and property in, this new, in these new states. And so the elites feared that the leveling of the playing field would be the redistribution of their land, which is really what symbolized wealth at that time. That's what you needed to grow crops, to raise livestock, uh, to really subsist was land. And so they feared that the land would be taken from them and redistri redistributed to everybody else, to the masses. If you think about it, you had a situation where you may have had one farmhouse and one family living in a very large house on just acres and acres and acres of land, probably worked by slaves. If you had a situation where you had hundreds of people come to that land in order to take it, what could they do to defend themselves as one family on that very large area of land. So they had a lot of conversations about this. They wrote back and forth a lot. George Washington wrote to James Madison, if a government cannot check these disorders, what security has man for life, liberty, or property? Liberty at this time was actually linked to money and property. It didn't mean any type of civil liberty for common people. It definitely did not mean freedom for slaves. It meant uh, that property which you were free to own. And so with Shay's Rebellion kind of tipping this off, this question really ran among the elite class. If we don't have a government which can do things like put down Shay's Rebellion, who's going to keep uh, my property from being taken, my liberty from being taken? James Madison wrote uh, in the Federalist Number 10, the propertyless majority must not be allowed to concert in common cause against the propertied class in its established social order. What would happen if people actually were allowed to get together and do something in a common fight against the people who actually had the money and were high up in society? Here's exactly what they were thinking. Dangerous revolutionaries. We had this group of founding fathers. And remember, we were looking at a system where the political system of the time was not giving power to the government. The government was the British. And because the founding fathers at the time and the American people at the time did not see that government as legitimate, the power system broke down and there was violence. That's exactly what the American Revolutionary War was. And after that violence, we got a brand new social order. No more British, no more monarchy. However, the new social order that was put in place was that men with talent for acquiring property could have power, even though they weren't born into nobility. So you didn't have to be of the line of the king in order to really have the power and rule the country. All you had to do was have a talent for acquiring property. You had to have that money. You had to have that land and that ability to generate wealth, which would give you the time and the ability to do this. That was the new social order which was created. So the fear is that the exact same thing could happen to this new government. Now the Founding Fathers weren't on the side of those lending the power, they were on the side of the actual new government that was created. And the fear was that all these restless soldiers who were coming back, these masses of people, would see their power as illegitimate. And if they did that, if they did not recognize this new government and give authority to it, and it broke down in the same way, there would be new violence. And this new violence was not something that the elite class was prepared to deal with. They didn't have their own mercenaries or, or leagues of, of soldiers who could come and protect them. And so they would fall to a new social order. And the new social order would be that every man would have equal access to power and property, and there would be a leveling of this playing field. This was the fear that the elite class had. What would happen if the popular people, the masses of people, joined together and actually fought against them and took back the wealth of the society and redistributed it among all of the people? You have to remember what this actually looked like in terms of population. You had to think in the minds of the elite. The us really is that, that bright pink area, the elites there. They had a very, very, very small population. And if you even were to gather up the middlers with them, if they were able to rally them, then that still wouldn't create a whole lot of people. Imagine the entire rest of the population being the them, and these tiny little slivers being the us, the elites. 
What would happen to us if they, the them, actually figured out that they had some power? What would happen to us if they actually figured out that they could band together and do something about the fact that they weren't happy that this tiny sliver of the population was running their lives, taking all of the money and taking all of the gain that society had to offer? What would happen to us is we would no longer be the elite. A popular uprising would completely level the elite class and make it so that all of that wealth, all of that property was distributed amongst everybody. Everybody else would have more. They would have more. We would have less. Obviously, this would be very devastating to the elite class and the system which was put in place by them. And so we called a second constitutional convention, just three months after Shea's rebellion. And as we spoke about last, Doing type things like calling a convention together was not a, a matter of picking up the phone and giving people a call and getting people together. This was a lengthy process. It took individuals running letters back and forth. It took coordination. It took people figuring out how to get to a certain area. And so for something to happen three months after Shays Rebellion really showed you what type of fire was put underneath the boots of the Founding Fathers at this time. They were so afraid of the rebellion and everything that it could mean and the potential leveling of society that they really got together almost immediately. Uh, you have to include travel time and communication time to all get together to think of a way to shore up their constitution, which by the way they had just got finished making, to create something which would now protect for this new threat against them.